Hello and welcome to another FAST interview from New Zealand. Uh, while I'm here, I'm speaking with a number of candidates and activists uh, to get an understanding of uh, the politics of New Zealand and also what are the big issues this election and probably most relevantly to the audience, uh, what Australia can learn from that. Now, uh, the media plays a big part in any election. Uh, but we saw an interesting phenomenon in the United States with the 2016 election where it was the alternative media which helped propel Donald Trump to the uh, pres presidency over the bias of the mainstream media who were angling for a Hillary victory. But sadly, uh, in Australia and other parts of uh, the Western world, it's still the, the mainstream media that sets the political agenda. Uh, but there are many like us at the Unshackled who are trying to change that, and there's also people in New Zealand uh, trying to uh, change that as well. Uh, what, uh, one such blog that is doing that is uh, Whale, Whale Loyal Beef Hooked, uh, which can be found at whaleloyal.co.nz. And I've got uh, its founder and editor, uh, Cam Slater, here, here with me today. It was started in 2005 and now has over 286,000 uh, monthly visitors. So Cam, thank you for that. <laughs> oh, you need to update your about page then. Yeah, oh, well, that's a few years old, but keeping up with that is um, something I kind of gave up on with statistics. When you get to number one and there's daylight between you and everyone else, you kind of don't care anymore. Yeah, well, there, there we go. It's, uh, it's, it's even greater, so that's, that's very Yeah, cool. I mean, if you look at the, um, the top 100 blogs in New Zealand, they used to, I used to participate in, in the statistics for that, but everyone kept accusing me of faking my stats, so I went, oh, well, I'll take them away then. But if you added up all the traffic of number two to number 100, uh, it still didn't equal my traffic, so that, that's the level that it's at. Uh, let's start from the beginning. So obviously you've, you've been in this for a long time, since 2005. What was the, the cabinet? What made you say, you know, right, I need to you know, have a platform to have my say? Uh, well, I, I come from a very political family. Uh, my father used to be the uh, president of the National Party, which is the equivalent to the Liberals in Australia. And, um, you know, I was brought up in and around politicians all the time. I've met every Prime Minister in New Zealand, uh, including Sir Robert Muldoon and since Sir Robert Muldoon. Um, they've either been in, in my parents' house or, or I've been around them or whatever. But, um, you know, so a highly political family. Um, I always used to shout at the TV screen. And then with the ad advent, uh, you know, abusing talk show hosts and you know, interviewers on television, why didn't you ask this question, why didn't you ask that question? And with the advent of blogging, it allowed me to shout at the world. And for a number of years, I was shouting by myself. Um, and then around 2010, uh, the audience started to really grow. And um, I became number one. I've won three media awards as well. And uh, I sit there at the top now uh, as a political commentator. And I've become less partisan. Um, yes, I'm fiscally conservative, but I'm socially liberal. Um, I was one of the biggest proponents uh, for the gay marriage debate, which Australia is going through at the moment. And my view on that was, um, well, if I had to have a mother-in-law, then I thought gay should too. And um, it was all about equality. And everyone deserves the misery of a mother-in-law. And it just made people laugh. Um, but it, it showed people that the debate is really as banal as that uh, when it comes down to, to equality. But um, I used to be a hardcore supporter of the National Party. I'm not anymore. Um, I don't support any political party. I'm not a member of any political party. So I basically have a default position that all politicians are ratbags and they're all lying and they only have to open their mouths to prove that. And they can disprove it if they want, but I'm um, yet to see one that tells the truth here. Uh, that's a very good attitude to have in the, in the, in the blogosphere. Now, uh, as you mentioned, uh, it was uh, at, the, at the beginning it was uh, very slow and a lot of people when they start blogs, their, their biggest fear is uh, no one will read it and it's... And no one is. Mm. You've, you've got to be really active and you've got to have a strategy um, and it's all about building traffic and there's lots and lots of different ways to do that. Um, I started off by commenting on a lot of other blogs, um, then people come and see, they click on the link to the, the, from your own post, um, and then they, they end up staying, then they start commenting and, and it just grows from there. 
um, but you've got to break stories. You've got to um, actually, you know, do do the work of a journalist. Um, that's how you end up with a big um, a big audience. The other thing too is be right. Don't be wrong. You know, there's one blogger who would love to be me. Spends his entire waking moments thinking about me. Um, every second post mentions me, um, and the guy's just a drop kick and a loser. You know, and um, he doesn't break stories. He just rants and raves, and and it's just not a very pleasant experience for people. I used to rant and rave, and I had a small audience. And when I put in place some good moderation and tidied everything up and made it a safe place to be, even though I hate that term, safe space, you know, um, then you got a lot more commenters. Then you get a lot more traffic. Then you get a lot more credibility, and it grows from there. So you you have to have a plan. You have to have a strategy. Um, I was shameless too. I looked at you know all the best bloggers around the world. Um, uh, you know, in in the UK, um, it's Guido Forbes, you know, uh, dot com blog. Um, in the US, it was uh, Andrew Sullivan and people like that. Uh, he's no longer blogging, and uh, I mimicked them and copied them. You know, in terms of what they you know they did for their structure and things like that. Um, I followed a couple of bloggers in Australia, but really their mainstream media pe- personalities that run blogs that are within mainstream media. Uh, there's not a lot of people that are like me in Australia that I'm aware of. Oh, well, uh, us at the Unshackled, we're, we're trying to change that. And certainly uh, the strategies that you've mentioned there, they're ones that we've adopted as well. Though we, you, your blog started before um, Facebook um, yeah. was big. That's what we primarily, primarily use to uh, promote our uh, content. And you're right, you have to be... Yeah, but where are your people commenting? On Facebook? Mainly on Facebook. So you've given your audience to Facebook. Well done. We've got an email list as well. Yeah, yeah, but still, you've given away your audience. I don't um, have too many comments on Facebook, almost no comments on Facebook, even though every post goes to Facebook. And I've done that on purpose. If you hand your audience over to someone else, they're making the money, not you. And, and it's got to come down to capitalism and the market forces. Um, this is why the ma- mainstream media is faltering. You know, Facebook came to them and, them and said, oh, look, you know, put all your content on Facebook and enable the comments there. We'll give you um, 100% of the ad revenue. Well, in the next year, I pre- predict that Facebook will change those terms and conditions, and they'll give them all a haircut. But you can't get your audience back; they're locked into Facebook. We are looking at ways to diversify our um, well social media and audience presence. But yes, Facebook is—it's it's, all—it's all consuming these days. It's very hard to to break free. Mm-hmm. Well, don't go there in the first place. But the second thing about social media is Twitter. I just use Twitter to push. I don't respond to people. I don't have conversations on Twitter or anything like that. Um, you know, politicians love it, but um, tweets, retweets, and Facebook likes aren't votes, and they never have been, and they never will be. And you can win the social media war and lose the election. And the Labour Party in New Zealand here has done that for three elections in a row where they've banked um, everything on their social media strategies. Um, you can't be knocking on the door and face-to-face talking with people. And retail politicians need to remember that. Uh, that's, a, that's certainly a very good, very good insight. And we can, I, I can understand why you're uh, so successful. I'll certainly take, <laughs> take, take that bit of advice on board. Uh, now, as you also mentioned, uh, it's not just about you know, taking you know, what's in the news and commenting on that. You've got to break the news yourself, not do like really long investigative pieces, but just, you know, do a bit of research saying, hey, did you, uh, did you know that this was happening? But you've got an audience that you can utilise those. Yeah. Um, a lot of people treat their audience as some someone to be milked. Um, I treat my audience as being smart and that there's people there who are experts in particular areas that you may not even know. And so, you know, asking your audience if anyone can help you analyze corporate spreadsheets or um, has got information on things. Um, it empowers your audience, but it makes them feel wanted and needed, and then they become very, very loyal, and they won't be moved at all anywhere else. You know, you, you can cop a flogging like I did in 2014 and still maintain your audience. Um, but you've got to build that loyalty. The way you build the loyalty is respect your audience and also be right, continue to be right. Don't, don't make outlandish predictions um, based on what you want to see. Look at empirical evidence, at statistics, at polling information, and, and analyse it um, 
you know, using pure math and statistics. That if, once you do you start doing that, then you start being right. And uh, once you're being right, then you get a reputation of always being right. And so you have a lot of interaction with your audience by email and uh, in the comments as well? In the comments, um, by email. Um, I, I, one thing I nicked off um, of Guido Forks was a tip line. You know, if you set up a tip line, uh, you anonymise it and let people send information in. Uh, you, you then only have the job of verifying that, uh, but it provides a constant source of stories. But I might turn to now to obviously, um, you know, as you said, you've risen to the top of the New Zealand media, which it's uh, having all the hundreds of thousands of uh, monthly uh, visitors in such a small country as quite a good achievement. Yeah, and millions of page views as well. Yeah. As, so, what's your assessment of the New Zealand media? I'm certainly not impressed by it. You've got about three companies which they all have a centre left. Uh, point of view, how do, how do you rate the mainstream media in this country? Uh, most of them are fat, dumb and lazy. Um, they, you know, I call them the shiny pants brigade. They sit there on, in, in their offices and they wait for stories to come to them. And in some respects I do the same thing. But what it means is that people like me, um, who uh, have got an axe to grind or information that we need to get out there wider, can utilise that. Because they, they write one story a day, um, I've got 30 pieces of content today going out. I've got information that's coming across my desk. And, you know, people say you're a journalist, and in some respects I am, in many respects I am. In other respects, I'm an information trader. And um, so you build networks, and it's something I learned as a salesperson before I got into blogging, that you give away two leads for every lead that you get in return. So um, I've farmed the, the mainstream media journalists. I've given them stories some of which they've won awards from, you know, um, and you hand those out on a two to one basis. Sometimes you get nothing back, but the point is, is that you're dominating, controlling and manipulating the narrative. And if you're um, skilled at doing that, then you can steer policy without actually having to go to the lengths of being a, a backbench MP or, or cannon fodder for a political party. Um, especially if you're a free agent like myself, not aligned to any political party, that means I can take up whatever um, issue I want. And uh, a classic example of that was um, uh, a count local council wanted to build a dam. It was going to be the biggest dam in New Zealand. They were going to get the ratepayers to fund that. They, were, they couldn't get any investors. The entire dam was based on, um, on a location which meant that 30 hectares of a state forest of a forest park was going to have to be flooded. That's against the law, so the, the dam was, was flawed from the start. Um, quite apart from the fact that the economic models that were based around that were, were heroic um, to make it work in terms of the amount they were going to charge the farmers for water. Essentially, that dam was going to socialise the, uh, the costs of the dam and uh, privatise the profits um, to the benefit of just 250 farmers. Um, so I opposed that, I opposed that dam vociferously and um, a couple of months ago it was cancelled. Um, but that was able to be done because we could control, dominate and manipulate the media narrative that was out there. Yeah, that's certainly uh, a, great, a great success and uh, in Australia at least it's, it's only been the... Uh, we, we still have some good mainstream media outlets in Australia, I mean the, the Murdoch uh, papers still do uh, a good job, but yeah, that's... that's yeah, this, I, I subscribe to the Australian, but it's the only one that I do. Yeah, uh, sadly, uh, like, like I said, you don't even have, have that in New Zealand, but it sounds like you're definitely um, taking up the, the fight. Now, um, obviously with success, uh, it attracts a lot of enemies, and there's a lot of people who you know, want to discredit you, or smear you, or threaten you. Uh, have you had much experience with that? <laughs> Probably more, uh, you know, more experienced than anybody else. Um, the 2014 election, uh, the last election before this one, um, a left-wing activist who calls himself a journalist but's really a book author um, obtained a substantial amount of my private emails and wrote a book about them and then attacked me, you know, using the proceeds of crime essentially. Um, but that didn't knock me over. They all thought it would be the end of me, and that they resorted to criminal behaviour to try and take me down. Uh, didn't work, and I'm still here, and now operate in a in a much safer, cleaner, and different way. So all they did is is make me better at what I do. 
Um, it was a pretty torrid election campaign, uh, part of which I was in Israel at the time and in Fiji. Um, so they timed the book for when I was offshore, so I was having to do interviews, you know, in the middle of the night um, with time delays from the satellite and stuff like that. It's not conducive. And when you've got sc screeching harpies, um, you know, like some of the, the female journalists that are, uh, were trying to interview me, it doesn't really help, especially when they talk over the top of you. But as I said, made me stronger, made me better, uh, made me operate in a different way. I'm still here. Um, and. Um, I'm still controlling the narrative despite what they say. You know, people are still talking to me. Journalists who were taking stories from me are still taking stories from me. So it hasn't done anything. Uh, one thing I've learned over the past year with the Unshackled is that your enemies will go to you know, any length to try and you know, sabot sabotage you, smear you. Uh, and so you've certainly got to have you know, a, a tough skin. I, say, I certainly know that you know, I knew what I was getting my myself into, but it's, it's certainly not a profession for the uh, uh, easily uh, upset. Oh, look, you're involved in politics, right? It's not Tilly Wings. And um, I get a lot of criticism for being brutal in the way that I play politics. And I was born in Fiji, and Fijians play rugby in a brutal fashion, especially sevens. They smash your face into the ground, basically, and stand there and smile. And that's, that's what I do. Um, I view politics as a blood sport. Um, uh, one that's got almost no rules, and um, and so you know I just play. I play for kids, and so do they. Um, and anyone who says different is dreaming. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I I agree that there's you know no rules in politics. Everything you know is fair game, and you've got to have that modus operandi. Well, I mean, I'd like to see New Zealand politics move into the more openness that exists in Australian politics. I mean. You know, Jacinda Ardern was having a big sook and a cry about um, attack ads from National. Um, I wouldn't call those attack ads, I'd call those truth ads. But, you know, there's nothing like the attack ads that the Australians have, nothing like that. You know, I, I remember the, the um, Kevin 07 Lemon, you know, attack ad, where, where they made Kevin Rudd look like a lemon. Um, there's a few others that are like that. It's brutal, brutal ads, and it's brilliant. Um, the US is the same. New Zealand. You know, they don't like, people don't like negative um, advertising, but negative advertising works. And this election has proved that, you know, Labour was rocketing up based, based mainly on a smile and a haircut. And, um, and out came the negative ads, which told the truth about the Labour Party, and down they went. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, everyone likes to claim that, oh, you know, our positive, you know, vision will, you know, win the day. It's just good. Yeah. And you have to remember that most people aren't engaged in politics, so you've got to give them a reason to... You have to have cut through. And, and that is one of the reasons why I use a lot of humour, why I use a lot of mockery, nicknames, those sorts of things, because you get cut through and people go, oh, oh, yeah, I thought that too. The other thing is you get a reputation of saying the things that people are too afraid to say themselves, because with the advent of social justice, bullies I call them, but they like to call themselves warriors, then you have the... The, the people on Twitter and Facebook and crusade against companies for saying or thinking the wrong thing, according to their point of view, you know, th these companies and people who cave into them are actually doing a disservice to society. You need to stand up to bullies and you need to say to them, nah, um, we live in a country with freedom of speech, so you, you might be upset, but there's plenty of other people out there who aren't upset. And just be shamelessly non-politically correct and say the things that people are thinking themselves and that's how you get an audience. Now, and that's probably uh, the alternative media's uh, biggest advantage, the fact that you have all these uh, media companies that are controlled by the major corporations who, uh, yeah, the slightest bit of outrage, they retract and you know, apologise and it's pathetic. I mean, I had demands for me to apologise for this and apologise for that and I just steadfastly refused to. No, I said that. What am I apologising for? You know, oh, well, you hurt their feelings. Well, I'm not apologising for hurting their feelings. You know, since when did sticks and stones cease to be relevant? That's another golden rule. I, or in politics and journalism, and never apologise. As soon as you apologise, then you're, you're basically admitting you were wrong. And sometimes you're not wrong. Um, you know, or you can do a, a Weasley apology where you say, I'm sorry if they were offended. You know, you're not sorry at all. Sometimes saying sorry neutralises it, but I wouldn't, you know, I don't bother with it. It's pointless. There's the things I said, that's what I believe. You don't like that? Change the channel. Yeah, and also, you know, once you make one apology, there'll be demands for apologies for other things. 
Well, you know, there was two radio hosts in New Zealand who did an interview which was pretty hard hitting. Um, and then all these social justice bullies came out and one of them sacked. Eventually they were sacked. Um, but they were doing their jobs, you know, and they were hounded out of their jobs by, you know, a couple of hundred people on Twitter. Well, if I had been in charge of that radio station, I would have told them to fuck off. People have opinions. We pay those radio hosts for their opinions. You don't like them, change the channel. Uh, and certainly, uh, mainstream media is getting getting worse in that regard. Now, um, obviously, you've been you know, following this election closely. By the time this is uploaded, we will know the results. So, uh, I won't ask you to make a prediction. I'll just ask you to give. I'll just give. I'll just ask you to give a summary of how you viewed the campaign. Well, you know, um, National was sleepwalking to victory with Andrew Little in charge of the Labour Party. Um, there was a definite strategy within Labour to replace Andrew Little. They just needed to have two or three polls come out in a row in short order to create that pressure. That's what happened. Uh, they then replaced him with Jacinda Ardern. Basically, they moved the number two in the party to number one, and the number one to number three. The policy uh, policies hadn't changed. That's all. All of a sudden, Labour rocket, rockets up in the polls and National had to scramble. Fortunately for the National Party, um, Labour's fiscal plan is a dog's breakfast. Um, their taxation plans, that they want to keep secret. They don't want to announce what those are before the election. Um, so you can run a fear, uncertainty and doubt campaign, and that's exactly what Steve Joyce did. He, he started what, using what I call what's known as Cunningham's Law. He put out a, a story about their a fiscal hole in their budget. Um, a whole lot of people started talking about the fiscal hole. They're still talking about the fiscal hole. It's three weeks now of the campaign taken up entirely talking about a hole in Labour's budget and their tax plans. Um, and it's hijacked the, um, the smiley face campaign of Jacinda Ardern. Um, Cunningham's law says that you put something out that's not quite right and then everybody then sets about trying to prove that you were wrong, but in doing so, prove that you were almost right. And uh, that's exactly what's happened. Um, so it's pretty cunning from Steve Joyce to do that. Um, and um, I think what we're going to see is, is a, essentially a three-horse race with Labour and National vying to be the top dog. Um, and uh, the, third, the third in the race will be Winston Peters, but he'll probably get around 10 or 11%. And um, he'll decide who the government's going to be. I've been, I've been amazed with the, the campaign. Like obviously there was you know a huge surge after just in our took over, but then she announced pretty much uh, a tax on everything. I mean, our in Australia Labor Party likes to tax, but this was just tax uh, overdrive. And like it would be better just to adopt a small target strategy, just you know have her make these you know uh, motherhood statements about you know child poverty and inequality and leave the detail to later, but they've given, you know, national on a platter ammunition to attack them. Well, that's the thing is, John Key got elected in 2008 by being a nice face and calming the middle classes to think that it was okay to stop voting for Auntie Helen and instead vote for Uncle John. And um, that's a, a strategy he continued to use, that there was only going to be incremental change, there wasn't going to be sweeping changes. They weren't going to apply horrific taxes, uh, you know, like capital gains taxes. Everybody inherently knows that when the government puts a tax on, it never ends up with what they promised. It always ends up with uh, You know, we've had GST started at 10%, went to 12.5%, it's now 15%. Um, you put on fuel taxes, um, the government raises the fuel taxes. Uh, Any time a government has the ability to willy-nilly raise, uh, raise a tax rate, they will. And, um, they should be opposed at every level um, with that. And the best way to stop them doing that is stop the taxes coming in in the first place. Yeah, well, it certainly looks like she's, uh, she's been well, caught out and uh, been exposed, and now she's done some backpedaling saying, oh, well, we'll only have a couple and then have a you know, tax working committee, which is also being ridiculed. Yeah, the ta tax working group, which will be filled with socialists who want to tax. Um, look, she's been caught out because she's believed her own press that she's this policy wonk and an expert. Um, I had lunch with her in 2008 um, with David Farrer as well, another blogger. And um, you know, that was three and a half hours of listen listening to somebody who had all the depth of a car park puddle in the height of a Melbourne summer. Um, you know, she has a lot of bumper sticker slogans, but there's nothing else there. Um, Grant Robertson is the ultimate fat, dumb, and lazy, you know, finance person. He's let everyone else do all the work. 
and um, his strategy was, I will explain it all after the election, but he's been caught out and his lead has been caught out as well. Uh, well, certainly we're, we're going to await the result uh, with eagerness. Uh, thank you very much, Cam, for, for speaking with the, the Unshackled and no giving us your insight, uh, being a successful vlogger, and I'm sure you'll keep going from strength to strength. Uh, world domination's the goal. Yep, hopefully. <laughs> All right, thanks. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment, and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.